What happens at the intersection of hip hop culture and architecture? I've dedicated my entire academic and professional careers to exploring this intersection. Before we look at hip hop being combined with architecture, I think it's important that we explore how black culture has transformed other art movements throughout time. I call this before and after hip hop. Here's the Eames chair before hip hop. Here's the Eames chair after hip hop. <laughs> here's Mona Lisa before hip hop. And here's Mona Lisa after hip hop, <laughs> where an artist took hip hop artists and painted them in the same light and medium as Mona Lisa. Here's NBA shorts before hip hop, which is nothing but a mistake waiting to happen. <laughs> and here's basketball shorts after hip hop. Here's headphones before hip hop. And we made those headphones into beats. Here's a record player before hip hop, which we turned into an industry. Here's Timberland boots before hip hop, a boot that is worn by contractors, people on construction sites who needed to protect their toes. And here's boots after hip hop. I don't even need to change the image. Timberland boots became so synonymous with hip hop, it was a fashion statement for our feet. And to have dirty Tims was blasphemy. The moment we got a scuff or any piece of dirt, the Timberlands were no longer usable. And that's just on the surface about how black, black culture is transformative. Let's take a second to think a little deeper. Pablo Picasso, Swiss architect Le Corbusier, were heavily influenced by black culture. They called themselves Negrophiliacs, which was their way of describing their infatuation with black culture. I'm sure many of you have heard of Jay-Z's Black Album, but how many of you have heard of Pablo Picasso's Black Period? During this period of Negrophilia, Pablo Picasso was heavily influenced by African tribal art. He would study and create sketches of tribal masks. And in his most famous piece, The Young Ladies of Avignon, he incorporated those sketches into two of the young ladies' faces. This piece would become the most famous piece that Picasso would ever paint, and it will become the first piece of cubism. African art changed the way that Picasso saw the world and how he saw himself. On the left, there's a self-portrait Picasso made after the blue period. And on the right is his self-portrait after the black period, where he painted himself with features that you typically would attribute to Africans the stronger facial features, and the large nose. Picasso was heavily changed by African tribal art, and he would deny that influence for a long time. But what else do you expect from a man who's famous for saying good artists copy and great artists steal? Will we not know Picasso or Cubism if not for his introduction to black culture? Architect Le Corbusier was literally in love with black culture. He had an intimate relationship with the most famous Harlem Renaissance artist, Josephine Baker. During that relationship, he developed an appreciation for black music, specifically jazz, where he said, Negro music has touched America because it is the melody of the soul joined with the rhythm of the machine the music of the era of construction, innovating. It floods the body and heart, it floods the USA, and it floods the world. Jazz is more advanced than the architecture. And if architecture was at the point reached by jazz, it would be an incredible spectacle. Cabousier noticed that jazz artists can come together without a plan and create something that had never been heard before because they have mastered the tools of their craft, which allowed them to come together in harmony in such a spontaneous way and create beautiful music. He wondered if architects would ever master our tools that allow people to come together 
and create architecture that had never been seen before. He will go on to coin the term Art Deco, which is an art and architecture movement that was heavily influenced by the Harlem Renaissance. Would we not know Art Deco if not for Cabousier's introduction to black culture? If Cabousier could fantasize about this merger of black music and architecture, and Pablo Picasso can transcend all the artists that were around him at that time by incorporating African tribal art, why can't we, constituents of hip-hop culture, black people, bring our culture into new arenas to create something that is totally new and unseen before? And that's what hip-hop architecture is. Hip-hop architecture is a critique of modernism. It's a critique of the style of architecture that birthed the culture. Le Corbusier had a plan. He had a plan to liberate the working class citizens of Paris. And in his book, The City of Tomorrow and Its Planning, Corbusier described the new modern town planning initiative that would transcend everything that was out at the time. He wanted to liberate the working class by providing them with, amongst other things, uh, these five items I'm going to highlight. He wanted to provide translucent prisms of glass. These would be the buildings that will give people immediate access to employment, and they would sit within vast lawns, which would surround the residents who are under the shade of trees with clean air and no noise. His scheme would go on to be deemed towers in a park. It's nothing but utopia, the perfect world. Paris was unsure of the social implications of this architecture and programming. What will the social implications be upon the inhabitants of the spaces? And because of that, his plan was heavily criticized, preventing it from ever being anything more than an idea for Paris. But there came a man who would use his plan, Robert Moses. Robert Moses was a builder in New York. And as he was building the Cross Bronx Expressway, he would look to Le Corbusier's plan to not displace residents who were in the way of his construction. But I call his implementation of Corbusier's plan the worst remix or sample in history. <laughs> During the construction of the Cross Bronx Expressway, he did not use any of the elements or amenities that Corbusier deemed necessary for such an architecture to be successful. Those translucent prisms of glass and vast lawns will become concrete jungles. The prisms of glass will become monotonous brick towers. This typology will become the typology that defined low-income housing across the nation. 1520 Cedric Avenue is officially recognized by New York as the birthplace of hip-hop. 1520 Cedric Avenue was built at the suggestion of Robert Moses, and it's based on Le Corbusier's plan that he created for the center of Paris. Now, this is officially recognized as the birthplace of hip-hop, but if you talk to any hip-hoppers, you can have an interesting conversation about whether that's true or not. Hip-hop architecture brings design accountability. Le Corbusier was a great architect, but his architecture disproportionately affected people of color. Hip-hop brings accountability to Corbusier. I often call him the forefather of hip-hop culture. Now, don't get it twisted. This is not a compliment. It's a criticism. It tells us that his architecture is beyond bricks and mortar, and that his architecture is the incubator of culture. And it allows us to define the processes, the planning, the policies that made the hood what it is, and stop people from using the cultural behaviors of people of color to describe why the hood exists. I call hip hop Postmodern hip hop is modernism's post occupancy report. Hip hop was born from modernism. It lived in modernism. And if anybody is going to give a post occupancy report, 
it's going to be hip-hop. Song after song is filled with counterpoints and commentary about modern architecture. Hip-hop is the voice of the voiceless. It is the voice of the unconsulted end users of public housing and modernism. And if we can listen to the music, we can understand just how unsuccessful this architecture was, and we can understand the injustices that are faced by people of color who live in communities based on modernism. Remember those five points I brought up earlier, such as the translucent prisms of glass and the vast lawns. Snoop Dogg in his song, Life in a Project, said, ain't no trees, the grass ain't green. And when I say it's all bad, you know what I mean. Grandmaster Flash took it a step further. No prisms of glass here. He said, broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the stairs, you know, they just don't care. Can't take the smell, can't take the noise, got no money to move out, I guess I got no choice. Rats in the front room, roaches in the back, junkies in the alley with a baseball bat. I tried to get away, but I couldn't get far, because a man with a tow truck repossessed my car. And what he's talking about here, again, is that architecture is beyond bricks and mortar. Architecture has an effect on the people who inhabit it. He will go on in that chorus, the chorus of the most famous hip hop song ever created. He will go on to say, don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes, it make me wonder how I keep from going under. And what he's talking about here is the psyche, the psychological impact that this architecture was having. And this chorus is in harmony with the critique of Corbusier's plan that he received in Paris back in the 1920s. This criticism said, poor creatures, what will they become in the midst of all this dreadful speed, this organization, this terrible uniformity? They were talking about the inhabitants of that architecture. What will happen? Said, here's enough to discuss one forever with standardization and to make one long for disorder. I deem this, predict, I deem this criticism a prediction of hip hop culture almost 50 years before hip hop culture was born in the Bronx. And if you look at lyrics, you can also see how psychology played a part in creating the hood. Shock G said, I'm in a rage. Oh, yeah? Why is that, G? Because other races, they say we act like rats in a cage. I tried to argue, but check it every night in the news. We proved them suckers right, and I got the blues. What was he talking about when he said, they say we act like rats in a cage? He was talking about sociologist J.B. Calhoun, who studied rats and mice in concentrations of high density with controlled resources. He would put these rats in towers, and he noticed that the rats changed drastically. He said that they were no longer rats because of how much they changed. And people started to parallel his subjects to humans and said that if we continue to develop cities in the manner in which we're doing it, Violence is an inevitable part of the inhabitants of these towers. America ignored those warnings and still created this architecture that J.B. Calhoun warned us about. So it's no surprise that you get songs such as this from Wu-Tang Wu featuring Streetwise. Street Chronicle, wise words by the abominable, high honorable rap quotable phenomenal. Seniority kid, I speak for the minority. Ghetto poverty, fuck the housing authority. This is what's starting to happen in hip hop and rap lyrics. They're noticing that the environment is having an effect. And if we can't listen to hip hop and change the way that we design our cities, hip hop is starting to encourage a new era of designers, a new era of urban planners, who can come and remedy the injustices faced by the people of color at the hands of modernism. Nah said, be boys and girls, listen up. You can be anything in the world in God we trust, an architect, doctor, maybe an actress, 
but nothing comes easy. It takes much practice. So Nas is encouraging people to become architects, to build our own communities. And when we do that, we can have design justice. Tiffany Brown is from Detroit. She grew up in the housing projects in Detroit. She would go on to get a master's degree in architecture and an MBA. She would come back and demolish the very architecture, the very housing projects from which she was born. This is justice. This is what happens when we create opportunities for more minorities to become architects, designers, and planners. When you combine hip hop culture and architecture, you get the cipher. This is the new process that brings many people together where ideas can flow. The design cipher was a process I created when designing a universal hip hop museum in the Bronx, where we brought together architects, urban planners, scholars, students, community members, politicians, and hip hop pioneers to create the architecture, to create ideas for the Universal Hip Hop Museum that will be in their community. Here's some of the designers and architects that I had come. These are my friends. These are hip hop architects. These are individuals I have grown up with, individuals who have grown up on hip hop culture. We also had the legendary artist Curtis Blow, the Sugar Hill Gang, if you don't know hip. Hop, the hippie to the hippie to the hip, hip hop, that's them. We also had Roxanne Shantae, one of the first female MCs to join us. And now, people from the community, hip hop artists who were born of modernism, born from architects' hands, were now controlling the hands of the architects. They were the architects. They were designing their own experiences, which will allow people to come and learn about hip hop. We joined with a sponsor, Autodesk Tinkercad, who came and provided a training for the hip hop artists and community members, allowing them to not only write down words and draw sketches, but create their own 3D models and print them out by the end of the third day. They were holding their architecture in their hand. My goal as I go around delivering this message to colleges and universities is to combat, is to combat the low number, which is 3%, 3% of all architects in America are African American. It is my hope that this narrative will provide the catalyst needed to increase that number. And I will create an army of hip hop architects who will look to remedy the injustices faced by people of color at the hands of modernism. Thank you. <laughs>